Hello and welcome to the third and final session of the FEA Masterclass. I'm glad that so many people joined for our last session and today we will finish our journey through the world of FEA and discover some very interesting new things related to numerics and dynamic analysis. First of all, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me loud and clearly and you s I think you already know this procedure. In the case everything is working fine, please click the raise your hand button in the go to webinar app to show me that everything is working. Yes, I already see some hands, looks good. In the case the uh, audio stream should drop for any reason, you can also use our toll free audio service numbers uh, which you see right now on the screen. Just dial one of the numbers and enter the access code once you're asked. Perfect, and now let's take a look at our today's agenda. I received a lot of emails from participants who asked if we can maybe talk about dynamic analysis today, since this is a very important simulation type. And therefore we decided to change a little bit the subject of today's topic, so we will focus a, li uh, a little bit more on dynamic analysis and we will also talk about numerics and a little bit about performance, but uh, due to the request we decided to change this. And the first part, as I mentioned, we'll talk about dynamic analysis. Uh, after that we will dive into the world of numerics and discover like which type of numerics is suitable for which kind of application. Finally, we will have a live demonstration. I will present your homework to you and we will have a Q&A. In the case you have questions, you can write them at any time in our question chat box and my colleague Krishna, uh, who joined us today, will answer your questions in the chat box or if they are uh, interesting for a larger audience, we can discuss them during the Q&A. And since this is our final session, let's directly start with our first topic, dynamic analysis. And um, Last week, as you can imagine, and also the week before, we used the so-called static analysis. And dynamic analysis is another uh, a simulation type on some scale. And first of all, what is dynamic analysis? And basically everywhere where you have time-depending phenomena, you'd have a dynamic analysis. A very good example is the simulation where you have time varying displacement, strains, stresses and forces. And um, in the end, everywhere where your system is responding to any combination of static trends and harmonic loads, you need dynamic analysis. And in the end, the difference between the dynamic and a static analysis is the question if inertia and damping effects are included or not. And if you take if you think about it, also at the if you take a look at the units of inertia damping, it becomes obvious that these are transient effects. And in the end of the day, of in the most of cases, it's a, it's also a question of of engineering. And in the end, you have to decide um, if you want to do a dynamic analysis or if a static analysis maybe is also good. And every every time you have to to ask yourself, can I neglect inertia and damping effects? And in the case they're not important, you can use the static analysis instead. But we will talk about the details right now. So, in the right corner, you can see an animation of a simulation we made for our dro uh, drone workshop. And this is a simulation of a drop test of a drone. And you can see how the drone is sitting the floor and then the surface of the drone is colorized by the von Mises stress. Well, red is a very high stress and blue is no stress. And as I mentioned, this is a very good example. And basically, we need dynamic analysis everywhere where we have cases with immediate loading, so with fast changing loads and boundary condition. And in this case, you can really see it. We have nearly until this um, drone is reaching the floor, we have no stress inside the material and in that very short moment where it's hitting the floor, you have a massive increase of stress, especially in the drone arms. And um, for in a dynamic analysis, load is necessarily a function of time or frequency. In this case, if you think about it, first of all, our load is equal to zero 
uh, because uh, we have a kind of free fall and just in the moment where it is hitting the floor there we have the loads and in this case it's definitely the load is a function of a time and you can just imagine it like this so if this is the time and this is our force it's looking like this and what is also possible with dynamic analysis to sorry to capturing the vibrational response of a of a freak of a, a time depending system and just imagine right now um when we talk about transient effects most of you think about unsteady simulations or unsteady processes but unsteady does not necessarily mean unsteady unsteady or transient can also be harmonic and in the end what is uh, uh, something common of all dynamic analysis types is that we have model cases where damping is involved as well as inertia effects and just to to give you some examples when do we need this kind of analysis very good example is everywhere where we have high velocities for example as an impact at a collision collision or a drop test and in the right corner you can see one example simulation from our public project library this is a drop test of a mobile phone and there are a lot of questions uh, we are dealing with when we want to develop such a device first of all we want to know will the housing withstand the fall and if not will the display crack based on this the crack of the housing and if you think about it um, we have also parts inside the foam which are maybe not directly in contact but which could also be damaged by the drop and we also want to find out if the electronic parts inside will withstand the impact and a, di a completely different kind of analysis uh, dynamic analysis we, uh, we need it everywhere where we have high frequencies for example in engines and any kind of rotating or oscillating machines and here a very good example is the steel bridge uh, I think you all know this video I, I it was shown to me several times uh, at university and school where a group of soldiers marching over a bridge and then the bridge starts to collapse because they're exactly walking in resonance with the eigen, uh, eigen frequency of, of the bridge and everywhere where we have this frequent uh, depending uh, effects uh, we can use this uh, dynamic analysis too to answer questions like will it withdraw a specific vibrational load and here we talk about the amplitude of the load as well about the frequency and also a question you want to answer is if any dangerous resonances can occur and just to make sure you all get the difference between static and dynamic let's take a look at this example and this is very important because static and dynamic is not necessarily related um, to the time uh, I will give you an example just imagine we have here a bar and this bar is fixed on the one one left left hand side and on the right side we will apply a load in the first case we will apply here a load which is slowly increasing so it's f from t f from t and just imagine we apply this load very slow so and this is a very important difference and if we apply this load very very slow for example with a electrical engine here then and we would measure the response what we will see is that uh, in a um, for a static simulation this response will look linear like this if we have a dynamic load for example let's imagine we take a hammer and we drop the hammer and then this hammer will hit the bar and then 
again uh, 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 f uh, uh, change this direction and go back. Then we would get this kind of displacement response of the um, bar. And in both cases we have a transient load, a time depending load, but here the question is how fast it is changing. And everywhere where we have a fast change we need a dynamic simulation. Everywhere we want to capture this kind of nonlinear reaction of, 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 of the uh, nonlinear response of the system. And just to make it clear, let's now take a look at the fundamental equations. And as you know from the two previous sessions, um, the fundamental equation of FEA is that the product of stiffness and displacement is a force. And for a dynamic simulation, we have add to some terms. First of all, our force, our load on the right side of the equation is depending from the time. And it's the same for deformation and displacement. In this time, uh, these values u, u point and u point point are time depending. I have not uh, uh, write it, uh, written it down because um, it takes a lot of space and usually in engineering we don't write it if, if it's a derivation but f for sure this is also time dependent. That's the very first um, difference. And then if you take a look we have some, some additional uh, terms. So u point, u is the displacement. And therefore, u point is u derivated by time, one time, and this is the velocity. And this c is the damping constant, and will give back us a force multiplied with velocity. And u point point is second derivation to, uh, of, of u against time and this is acceleration. And this looks pretty similar to Newton's law we have mass multiplied with acceleration is also a force. And what you can see in this red box is our static equation and everything else we have to add it for a dynamic motion. And just let's take a look at the different components we have. As I mentioned, we have the inertia force which is induced by uh, the accelerated mass of the system, the product of m and u point point from time we have viscous damping and there we have basically what is happening that we have a force which is induced by energy dissipation and basically it converts kinetic energy of the system into heat in a mic micro scale system and we have the already known elastic force, the elastic resistance of the system and finally on the right side the applied load as a function of time. Um, now let's go a little bit more in detail and talk about forced vibrations. And the forced vibration refers to a harmonic response. We will discuss this just in some seconds. And another type of vibration is damped free vibrations and undamped free uh, vibrations. If you take a look, the forced vibrations, that's why they're called forced, they are induced by a time depending force on the right side. The damped free vibrations, there you have no force on the right side and the undamped free vibration you have no exciting force on the right side and since it's undamped this whole term with the damping constant or the damping matrix is disappearing. And if you want to calculate the damped and undamped free vibrations um, you will see that first of all the results does not seem to help you but you need this kind of resource to perform a harmonic analysis. So every time if you want to do such a harmonic analysis uh, you first of all need the uh, undamped free vibrations 
to calculate the natural modes of the system and then you can use this as an input to calculate the response for the forced vibrations. And since we're talking about damping, let's talk about some important um, representation, uh, representations. First of all, so how is damping represented? Therefore, we use the ratio sigma, which is calculated by dividing the actual damping by the critical damping. And a higher ratio means that we have a more damped system. And then we have basically three cases. The first one is a so-called critically damped case. When the damping C becomes equal to the critical damping CC, which is the product of 2 multiplied with the square of K and M. Um, then we have critical damp da it's a critical damped system, as I mentioned. And it means we have a damping ratio of 1. Overdamp means when the damping is higher than the critical damping and underdamped when the damping is less than the critical damping. And let's take a look at this uh, graph to understand what it means. And <coughs> I, here I would like to refer to a, a very simple assembly I think you all learned at school. Just, uh, just uh, uh, think about it. I would have a spring here. The spring is fixed here, then I have a damper here, and here I have a mass M, I have stiffness C here. And if you take a look what is missing, this is K and this is C. And if I would like, for example, now pull this mass down and release it, it will start to vibrate. And if I have a critical damp system, what will happen is that uh, the energy, which is represented by the amplitude of 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 the movement of in this direction of x direction of this mass, will rapidly decrease because all the energy is damped and dissipated into heat. If it's over damped, it will also dissipate, but much slower. It will still stay stable, but take more time to get damped. And if it's under damped, I will get a lot of oscillation, which can really harm any technical product. Here you can see it. And then it takes most of, uh, a lot more time until the, the uh, uh, excitation is completely damped. And uh, it's important to know that most structures have critical damping values in the range of 0 to 10%. Uh, so even very, very low values can result in large damping. And to avoid computational effort, because calculating this is quite uh, uh, computer time expensive, uh, we can use the solution for an undamped natural eigen frenzy as a starting, uh, starting value, as I already told you. And then you can include the damping to the other phase of the analyzers when you do the harmonic analyzers. Okay, then. Um, let's take about difference between time domain and frequency domain. These terms are used a lot of time also at school and now let's try to, to, to bring some light into it. So um, time domain means the transient response of a structure to an arbitrary load, while frequency domain is a response of the structure to a harmonic sinusoidal load. And just to understand it, Basically, I can convert everything from time to frequency domain. And just take a look. Here we have a plate and we have an excitation with the force here at the corner. And we are measuring a response to displacement on the other corner. And if we take a look at the time domain, we will maybe measure something like this. Just take a look at this green one. which And here on the time domain, we have the amplitude versus the time of signal, while frequency domain, we don't care for the time, since it's a harmonic effect, 
and we just represent it by amplitude and the related frequency because as long as the frequency of the signal is not changing its constant and the amplitude is not changing its constant we can represent it this way and uh, depending on the application you should use time or frequency domain. The example at the beginning we had was a drop test. It's definitely a case for time domain. While when we have rotating parts like in a, a turbo machinery, we should use frequency domain. And now let's put in a nutshell and talk about all dynamic analyzer subtypes on some scale. We have so-called frequency analyzers, which supports undamped free vibrations and will we give you back the real eigenvalue, uh, the, the eigenvalues of your system and the eigenmodes. And as I mentioned, um, it's a, we use this simulation type as the first step to get some information we need for a harmonic analysis. Just think about this bridge. We want to know if how, what how this bridge will respond to harmonic loads, and we want to understand at which load this will happen. So what we do first of all is frequency analysis which will give us back the eigenmodes and eigenvalues and eigenfrequencies of this bridge. And in the second part we can use the eigenfrequencies we found out during the frequency analysis as the input for the model analysis. And there we have undamped as well as damped force vibrations. Uh, we have uh, and we will receive a steady state response to a load to that varies as a function of t time or frequency. In this time, this frequency for sure. And um, this is, is really important to understand because these are like two different steps I have to take if I want to perform a harmonic analysis. And it's also very important to know that since I don't, I ha I'm having undamped free vibrations only for the frequency simulation, I don't need any boundary conditions. And that's a big advantage. The frequency simulation is independent from the external loads. Another simulation type is a dynamic linear or nonlinear solver. This one was also used, for example, for the drop test. And this kind of solver supports. Uh, Yes, uh, also uh, supports linear, nonlinear uh, calculation of transient responses. And here transient means that our load varies as a function of time. Another good example is the spring valve assembly, where this camshaft is like exciting uh, the valve. Great, and now let's talk about a little bit about the goal of dynamic analysis because in the end of the day you want to improve your product with the help of simulation and um, basically a very good example is, is this valve assembly I talked about you have to imagine this valve uh, a camshaft in a, uh, in a um, combustion engine is rotating with a very high speed and at very high engine speeds, sometimes we have effects called valve flattering, where the valve is like not under control anymore by the by the cam, and this can really lead to to serious engine damages. And what we simulated here was at which frequency will this assembly start to flat? So at which re frequency um, will this bring looser contact um, to uh, this part here and um, especially we were interested to see how long it takes until the system becomes stable again and for analysis like this or for questions like this uh, dynamic analysis is really a big help and a very important point of dynamic analysis is that it's, u it's uniqueness so simulation only covers the behavior of the structure subjected to exactly this dynamic loading and you can also use it by the way the study uh, the study use it to study the exit physics of the vibration structure and inertial effects and just some examples what dynamic analysis is used for. So here, for example, uh, we also talked about study uh, that you can study vibrations due to instant load. Well, this is a completely different example. This is a kind of drop test of a human bone 
headphone with and without the helmet. And here you can really see the difference. So uh, this skull hit it, this plate with the same ve as uh, velocity. And here you can see the difference of the acceleration, which is much, much smaller if you wear a helmet. But there are some disadvantages with Compass Dynamic Analysis. First of all, it's computationally very expensive. There is no analytic formula for you for our displacement, so we need time integration schemes and you know advanced know-how to set up this kind of simulation. And therefore we will talk about numerics right now and I hope that this is a starting point for some of, of our participants to, to, to get a lot of expert know-how in the field of finite element analysis. And first of all, why do we need numerics? And let's take a step back and, s and make it based on examples of the static analyzers. As you know, in the end of the day, the idea of finite element analysis is to transform a, a, a real-world analytical problem into a linear equation system and solve it an, uh, numerically. And as you know, in the end what we do, we have a known matrix K, the stiffness matrix, we have a known uh, force vector f and what we don't know is the uh, displacement vector u and we want to calculate this displacement vector. And this basically, this kind of, uh, is, is, is this is a kind of linear equation system, we can write it uh, as a matrix and it will look like this. And let's take this example, you can, so 1, 2, 6, 1, 1, Four, two, three, thirteen, x, y, z, and then nine, five, ten, twenty-three. And you may remember the Gauss method from school to solve this kind of linear equation systems. And what you do basically, you are modif mo uh, modi you're doing a modification of the matrix of the whole linear equation system. And this will, the end aim is to to get this form of the uh, matrix where everything below the diagonal is empty, is zero, and then you can directly read what z, calculate y from z, and calculate x from y and z. And on the SimScale platform for FEA, there are two types of solvers to solve this uh, linear uh, equation systems. One of them are called the direct solvers, and these direct solvers are exactly based on this approach of Newton. They modi do a modification of the stiffness matrix, therefore they require that the matrix is symmetric and positive definite, what uh, every FEA matrix should be, and if not, you will get the warning during meshing, because then you can't solve it. And in the end, uh, since numerically this direct Newton approach would lead to a lot of problems, uh, we they use a little bit different approach. They are disassembling the matrix K to a product of two matrices, matrices, uh, the product of L and U, and then L and then L, uh, U matrix U and displacement vector U are replaced by vector Y, and then in the end we are solving this equation system. And on the platform you have different available types of direct solvers like spools, multfront, nums. And I would suggest to start with multfront and if this is not stable enough use nums. Another mod uh, possibility is to use iterative solvers. And instead of modif doing a modification of the stiffness matrix, this uh, iterative solvers, as the names say, are solving this matrices not in one step, but numerically and with iterations. And here the idea is, or the approach is to split K to a sum of matrices. So K is split into D, L and U. And then we have the standing operating procedure. You can see here. And then we can iterate it, and we can start with a, a, a guess guess value for uh, for u, and then we can get, we'll receive iteration by iteration 
a better approximation of you. And here you can see C. And C is calculated based on the solver, iterative solver you choose. And this is the only difference between all these uh, iterative solvers. And on the SimScale platform, there are different kinds available, like Koleski, PTSC, GCPC, which are all based somehow on Koleski. And I would suggest to start with Koleski and if you run into numerical problem to use PTSC. Iterative solvers are less stable than direct solvers, but they are faster so and you should only use them if you have a very large uh, a mesh a very large matrix where you need parallel performance and just here an example so we have an error and for example the first iteration the error is quite high and then with every iteration it becomes smaller and smaller and there is a setting in the SimScale platform for iterative solvers where you can set the tolerance when you should stop to iterate um, the, the, this calculation. Another very important point is the time in, the other time integration schemes. Um, as you know, um, we have a dynamic simulation, therefore we also need to know what happens bef uh, we need to calculate the different time steps. And if you just think about it, implicit means that if you take a look at this equation, um, there is no explicit definition of y at the next time step, but there is a definition based on the right side of zero. And here we can indirect implicit calculate uh, the next time step. Um, These implicit schemes are more stable and can therefore cover larger, much larger time steps. But uh, a very big disadvantage of this implicit integration schemes is that they require the calculation of the inverse of the stiffness metrics. And since the methods are uh, directly used for solving the displacement vector. And we have four different schemes available. I would suggest to start with Silber, Hughes, Taylor. And uh, if you got into numerical problems, you can also try the other one, especially Crank and UMAC method. And um, the new Mac method is the default method on some scale, and with the standard parameters, it should be unconditional stable. And the uh, convergence is, by the way, second order, which is quite good. But everywhere we have nonlinear analysis, it can become unstable with implicit uh, time integration scheme, and especially lead to artificial and undamped oscillations, which would not exist in reality. And then, as I mentioned, you should try Hilbe, Hughes, Taylor, or the Crank method. Another way for time integration is explicit time integration. And here we calculate the next time step quantities based on the current step quantities. And we don't need no implicit integration to find the solution and therefore we don't have to inverse the stiffness matrix. But there are also some disadvantages. So it's not stable all the time and we can use it only for very, very small time steps. Here's just an example how you calculate the explicit time step for central differences. Here you can see how it's calculated based on the uh, actual value and the value before. And basically there the time step is limited by a minimum time step which you can calculate by dividing a characteristic element length to the wave propagation velocity. And this wave propagation velocity is a material constant. So for steel, this example, we would have 10 millimeters of steel. Uh, our minimum time step would be 2 mi microseconds, so for one second of real time we would need 0 0.5 million time steps, just for you to understand um, uh, the problems related to explicit time integration. And now we come to the final part of numerics, the nonlinear resolution. As you know, uh, everywhere we have nonlinearity, we have to resolve it somehow. And you might remember um, at the beginning um, of the last session, we talked about geometrical nonlinearities. And to calculate especially them, we need a nonlinear solver. And at some scale, therefore, we use the Newton method. The Newton, Newton method is a general method for solving nonlinear root problems. I think you, you learned it at school, maybe, if you studied engineering or something related. And basically, what it does. It finds a series of approximations that converge towards the solution of our nonlinear equation. And just let me give you an example. It's, we start somewhere, 
And there we, for example, at this point, and then we go to the function, and then we calculate the tangent at this point. And then we can tangent where calculate where the tangent would cross the x-axis again. This is our next point. Here we do the same thing, which will bring us back to here and the other way around. And what will happen in the end is that we will travel like this until it becomes stable. And you can see that we will end somewhere here. And the next uh, part of the series is found by linearizing f around x. And if you use an iterative solver, you have to use the newton Krylow method, which is tailored for massively parallel calculation. Right, and this was our uh, first 30 minutes about theory, and now let's take a look at some hands-on stuff, and therefore I prepared something for you. And today we will have a, a take a look at a dynamic simulation and here you can see a geometry, it's a phone. And today we will do again a drop test and this, if you take a look, this geometry, how it is made. We have here, sorry, here for example, why is it not working? Now, here we have, first of all, this part, this is a, the chassis, the frame of the phone. Here we have dummy for the floor, and this is the glass of the phone. We have removed the internal parts to simplifi simplify our problem. And first of all, the step for this kind of simulation is to create a mesh. And here you can see we basically used uh, TED dominant meshing with manual global element sizing from 2 millimeters to 0 0.7 millimeters and a custom mesh grading. The mesh is first order without quadrangular elements and we only needed four cores to calculate the mesh. And then we added some refinements. The first one is on the floor and it's not a refinement, basically it's making the mesh more coarse. And this is just because later on this whole floor will be completely fixed and therefore since no no ma uh, node can move uh, we don't need to care for the mesh quality and can focus on reducing the mesh size and therefore this settings will lead to a very coarse mesh and we added a surface refinement for the contact patch between the glass and the, the housing of the phone. And the next step is therefore to set up simulation. So we choose dynamic analyzers at once, at once because we have nonlinear uh, deformation later. Then we had to define two contacts. The first contact is between the phone assembly or in, inside the phone assembly. So a contact between the body of the phone and the glass. Let me wait until it's loaded and I can show it to you. here. So here you can see it. Then we have to add a contact also between the floor here and the corner of the phone which will drop here. And then we have to define the material. So for the floor we use this default ground material. For the glass we have a material, a linear elastic material. And for the aluminium we uploaded uh, what you can see here, the stress plastic stress strain relation, relation. Perfect. And then what we need to do is basically is to define our boundary condition, initial conditions. So at the beginning of our simulation uh, it should move with minus 2 meters per second in that direction. And then we have just to fix the floor and our simulation is basically defined. Two things we should do also is to change the numerics from both front to mums because it's more stable. And what we also did, if you take a look at simulation control, and this is maybe when we talk about performance, we ramped everything. So if you take like a look, our time step is changing with time. 
And at the beginning, we have a very large time step. And this is the time it takes until the phone is just before hitting the floor. And since we don't expect any changes there, we can use one large time step. And from the moment where it's hitting the floor, we use a very small time step to resolve all the rapid changes. And if you take a look at the finished simulation, it took, by the way, it took us 50 minutes to run the simulation, uh, then here on the post processor take a look at the solution fields here we can see displacement now let's change it for example to for me the stress Show the legend and then let's maybe update it and use a little bit different values. For example, let's start to visualize what is happening inside the glass. And the yield strength of glass is 6.5 EO7 Pascal. And And now everything which is red, the, the glass will basically break. And now let's start our animation. You can see, and the glass would break here without, without any protection, it would break here completely. And we can do, and you can see then after some time also starts to crack here. What we can also do is to change the legend a little bit and focus more on the aluminium. Now you can see that we have plastic deformation here. Here it's a corner, wait, sorry. Here we have plastic deformation. Well, okay. And now I think that's a good part to talk about your homework, a good, uh, because your homework will be to redo this kind of simulation on your own and simulate what happens if you put the phone into a rubber cover and if still the glass and the phone housing will break. Uh, I will send you tomorrow an uh, email including a link to the step-by-step -step tutorial, the recording of this webinar, but you can also find all the resources on simsilia.com slash FEA masterclass. Great, then this was our final webinar. Thank you very much for staying here with us and now we have time for our Q&A. Thanks! <laughs>